Praise God. God bless you. You may be seated. I'd like to dismiss the clock for you. Too. Thank you again for leading us in worship and praise unto the Lord. To worship you, I live. To worship you, I live, I live to worship you. I don't know what it is about those words, but when I'm walking down the sidewalk and I've, you know, scanned the area and I don't see anybody outside, I like to just let one of those out. <laughs> now, I get caught once in a while, and then I just give them one more. <laughs> Hallelujah. What a statement. To worship you, I live. To worship you, I live. I live to worship you. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Before, uh, before it, we dismiss the children, uh, Brother and Sister Pacheco and Brother and Sister Kaufman are ministering in Lakewood today. Just thought I'd let you know. It was requested that we would send a team while they were away, the leadership at General Conference, and so, amen, that's where they are today. God's blessing be upon them. Let's pray for them right now. Father, we pray for Tiscani and Heather Pacheco today. We pray for Brother and Sister Kaufman today. We pray the anointing that breaks the yoke to be upon them, Lord. The inspiration of your spirit, lead them in your word. The declaration of your forever settled word, Jesus. I pray, touch those people. Minister, Lord Jesus, the way that you do. In Jesus' mighty name. Let's be a people who shares. Amen. Next week is Brother and Sister Heiner's last Sunday with us. Brother and Sister Heiner Jr., if I could. He has taken a position, a different position and job, and they will be moving. And so we want to give them our condolences. And then we'll add some words of encouragement and blessing. Amen. They have been such a wonderful part of Life Church over these last, I just say many because I lose track. And we're thankful for the ministry that has flowed through them, through their lives. Amen. They are precious people. Praise God. We will miss you dearly. All of you, especially, especially that little girl. And his, her brother, sorry, Jaden. Amen. Um, we're going to dismiss the children to go downstairs. I'm feeling very nostalgic and historical these last 24 hours. I came to the Lord in the 80s, the early 80s, and my, my pastor, Daniel R. Leslie, he had a lot of history. He was, he tells of how his mother abandoned him and his brother as babies and did not want to raise them and brought them as babies to grandma, grandpa, and lots of aunts and uncles. They were sheep shearers in the Northwest and traveled the Northwest. And he talks about his role as a little boy rolling up, you know, 
wool, I guess. But uh, they were Pentecostal, and uh, he said, second week being born, we were sleeping under Pentecostal pews. He tells uh, at a, at, that at, in his teens at some point, he had gone to, he said, you know, he got into a lot of trouble. He was a troublemaker. <laughs> he said he stole a saddle one time at the, from the Toppenish Livestock Auction, and I just happened to be there last week, or this week. And uh, so I was thinking about that, and talks about later when he got the Holy Ghost, how that he would kneel to pray, and all he could see was that saddle. He tried to pray under it. He tried to pray around it. The eventuality was he had to take that saddle back to the livestock auction and then witness to them that God had filled him with the Holy Ghost and his life was different now. He, uh, he attended as a young boy a camp meeting, you know, outdoor, sawdust on the floor, tent camp meeting in Bend, Oregon, That's where he received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And he tells of rolling in the sawdust. And, you know, so he he was a real uh, adversary, not adversary, opposite word, advocate, sorry. He was an advocate for the campground. He was an advocate for camps because of his initial experience in that campground and receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And I enjoyed spending time with him in the car mostly any time. I would often drive or at least chaperone, go with him to various meetings around the Northwest, oftentimes, many times. And I loved to hear his stories. And uh, he was often talking about the truth of the Word of God. One time we were coming home from a fellowship meeting in Walla Walla. We were in one of the church vans. We had three. It was packed to the gills. He was driving. I don't know how that happened. Late at night, he was driving. I was co-pilot, and we got to talking about the oneness. And the more he talked about the oneness, the excited her. He got in the foot, kept pushing down. And all at once, he looked down, and he said, Oh, my God, we're going 100 miles an hour. And I looked back, and the hand grips were on the seats, and people were just looking straight forward. <laughs> they weren't in a conversation. They were scared for their lives. And, oh, he slowed down. And I think the, Lord, the Lord's hand was upon us in all of those travels. I, I can recall coming home from fellowship meetings at 6 o'clock in the morning on icy roads, driving back from Spokane. Three vans filled with people. And he was in, he and other pioneers, they called them the pioneers of the Northwest District, they were the anchor. They were the anchor for Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. And I was amazed at how willing they were to travel six hours to have a meeting, drive up to Colville and do an outreach. And he, Brother Hurst, Brother Crosley, Brother Joseph, they, these are the men that stand out in my mind. Brother Heiner would know who I'm talking about. Senior, I don't know about junior. But uh, I can remember a picture of them when we bought, as a district, a piece of property in Cleelum to establish a campground. And I can remember those four men uh, with shovels in their hands, standing up on the railroad bed, uh, just posing for a picture that here's the beginnings of what would try to become the campground. There was a lot of resistance from the community, different things that were fighting against us, really establishing it. Even though we tried hard, eventually it was shut down and the property was sold. But these are... These are rich memories for me because he was such an advocate for the truth. I was going to blend this into where I'm going to teach here today, but I just feel like I want to lay the foundation with this. These memories and this communication. 
He told me of a time when he decided to leave Yakima and go back to Missouri. He had a pastor named Brother Christian. He had, I think he had gotten cancer and he was bedridden. And he had gone another direction. There was a movement that started around 1948, about the same time as things were taking place over in Israel. This movement started up here in the Northwest that would be called the Latter Rain Movement. And his recollection of the Latter Rain Movement was, let's put our doctrine aside. This is what the, as the religious community, mostly Pentecostals, they said, let's put our doctrine aside. Let's just come together, love each other. Let's make room for spiritual giftings and all this. And, and he said to me, we lost half of our churches in the state of Washington to the latter rain movement. And he said, my pastor was one of them, Brother Christian. And so when brother, once Brother Christian died, he stayed there with him. He went to the church in Toppenish, and once he passed away, Brother Leslie packed up his family, and they headed to Missouri, because that was where St. Louis, where the headquarters of the United Pentecostal Church was, and he felt like for him to become doctrinally sound, he wanted to be around brethren that were sound, and he said everything that could be shaken was shaken here. Now, I would eventually come to meet some of those folks. They would eventually pass through Yakima, show up, you know, every two or three months and just sit in a service. And Brother Leslie would tell me who they were. He'd say, now, those folks, they're nice people. He said, now, they went out with the Latter Rain movement. He said, now they float. They just float around. They have no home. They have no consistency. They just float however the Spirit will lead them. I can remember the woman sitting in her seat. She had cut all her hair off. Brother Leslie would call it bobbed, her bobbed hair. But she had cut it all off, and she would sit there waiting for some prophetic word to come to her that she would want to deliver. I think I only saw it happen one time. And there was no witness of the Holy Ghost. Okay? And he said, that is the end of the road for many that went that direction. To set aside sound doctrine and to chase after spiritual giftings and and uh, a new thing that God was doing. I'm thankful for the time that I was able to spend with him and he could share with me. Really not even know what, what my future would become. I was not in the ministry. I was... Just a laborer, a worker, I, I did whatever they asked me to do. But we became a part of all the ministry of that congregation. Things come and go. The Spirit of God moves. And people, well, let's get into the Word. I want to admonish you to buy the truth. Second Timothy chapter four. Aren't you thankful for YouTube? I mean, if you got to fix a leaky sink, where do you go? YouTube, figure it out. Go get your parts, fix your sink. So many things in life now we can use that as a valuable medium and tool. But at the same token, there are many self-proclaimed prophets, apostles, uh, you name it. They're all over the Internet. And their 
doctrine or lack of doctrine, there's just a lot of spiritism, and they're driven by many things. This is not a new thing. We just have more exposure to it. Nowadays, because the touch of a finger, the click of a mouse, and uh, you can watch the prophetic all day long if you want. That's what they're calling it. But they are many drifters, and again, self-proclaimed. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, I charge thee, therefore before God, the apostle Paul to Timothy. Oh, now, now let me read this again. Watch this. This is interesting. I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Look, there's two, isn't there? Oh, wait, let's keep reading. Who shall judge the quick and the dead at their appearing? Oh, no, it says his appearing. Is the writer confused? Not if you have the understanding of the mighty God in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. He shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth. They shall turn their ears away from the truth. Not a truth, not some truth, but the truth. They shall turn away. Which end of the timeline are we at? Are we closer to the beginning? Or are we closer to what we might deem the ending? So if it's a there shall be, it's down the road. We're probably closer to it now than ever if we're not just right in the middle of it, okay? So, this is only one scripture that makes this statement. There are many in the Bible, many deceivers, uh, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. There'll be more and more. Again, their self, their own selves are at their middle, the middle of their motive. Okay, so because of all of this exposure with YouTube, we have to have practice caution. But how do I know if what they're saying, how do you know that what they're saying is not true? Well, that's easy. Study the original. Study the original. Again, back to Pastor Daniel R. Leslie. He worked at Frank's Tire Shop. And a car came in one time with a flat, and he was fixing the flat. He looked up. He noticed the license plate. It said U.S. Government, Department of the Treasury. Oh, what brings you to town? I understand you got a lot of counterfeit money passing through your area. Oh, we do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He thought for a minute. He said, what's it look like? I don't know. So wait a minute. You came here because there's counterfeit money to find the counterfeit money, and you don't know what it looks like. Nope. I don't know what it looks like. He said, I've spent hundreds of hours studying the original. And so when a bill passed in front of my eyes that there's something wrong, it's like there's immediate register. Ding. Something wrong, something off, counterfeit, counterfeit. So how do you suppose we are protected 
with sound doctrine, studying the original, thoroughly looking to the Word of God to know for ourselves that when something is spoken that is an error, ah, immediate, that's error. So we're protected if we study. So let me give you the stuff that came at 1.30 this morning. There's a word used, uh, denominal churches. Now, it became popular with the more progressives to say, oh, we're non-denominational. As though somehow that was a safety net. As though somehow uh, that was uh, better. You know, we're not going to trap you in any creeds or dogmas or truth. We are non-denominational. I remember, I, I can hear my cousins now inviting me to their church. The open Bible. Non-denominational. We don't have any of those my, I had a cousin say this to me one time, and it just irked me. We don't have any of those AG altar calls anymore. Well, what she was talking about was my grandmother's Assembly of God Church. Now, it's, it's not that I, I don't know, that's where I went when I first went. But I thought to myself, what's wrong with an altar call? I can't wait to the end of a service to get down to the altar. But again, it's this area of don't we don't, we're not interested in conviction we're not interested in what you call the truth of course they don't say that because they don't understand what they're saying but non-denominational i did a little search you know what that adjective non-denominational means what came back to me open or acceptable to people of any christian denomination Non-denominational religious instruction. Wikipedia, you know how when you do a search on something and then you get, you know, the five questions down below? What about this? What about that? What about that? All related to your initial search. So Wikipedia, question. What does being non-denominational mean? A non-denominational person or organization is one that does not follow or is not restricted to any particular or specific religious denomination. What do you follow? Nothing. What do you believe? Well, nothing. Just come as you are. We don't care about anything. But we've got a great band. And we're not going to make you wear a tie either. You come in your pajamas as far as we're concerned. I mean, the speaker's wearing pajamas. <laughs> You're laughing. I'm not. This is the reality of the climate and the world that we are living in. Buy the truth and sell it not. Okay? Now, another question. What is the meaning of non-denominational church? Non-denominational Christianity or non, same word, consists of churches which typically distance themselves from the confessionalism or creedalism of other Christian communities by not formally aligning with a specific community. It used to be all churches had a sign in front, the Baptist church. 
the Presbyterian Church. The Catholic Church. And when you read that sign, you had some semblance of what they were teaching there. If you knew anything about their faith. Now, if, if I was moving to another part of the country, and, you know, this is the days before mapping and Google and all that stuff, I might look into a yellow. If I'm a Baptist, I'm going to look in the yellow pages, and I'm going to look and see, oh, there, right there. Oh, wait, no, that's Southern Baptist. Uh, let's go to this one. And so a person would start attending based on uh, at least some understanding that this is what they taught and believed. And this is where my origin was. This is where I came from. I've had people ask me, is this a United Pentecostal Church? Well, yes, it is. Now, we don't talk about it a lot. But the, what it did was it gave them a clear-cut answer. I'm really wanting to know what you believe. Now, this could be said of other groups, of course, other organizations, but let's go back to Brother Leslie. He said there were so many independent Pentecostals, and you could get a, as a pastor, you could get a call at any time. Hey, I'm Brother Williams, and I'm up from uh, Arkansas. I can't talk that way. I'm up from the south, and uh, I was passing through, and I was wondering, could you preach me? You were, you're who? And you're from where? Well, I guess you're, come on. And then they'd get in the pulpit, and they'd start preaching stuff, and the pastor would start looking, and the people start looking at the pastor, and what is going on here? Why? Because there was confusion. In the doctrine. So here's what happened. There were those in the Pentecostal movements that decided to organize and merge, come together around the basis of doctrine, specifically the redemptive message. And then we, it, there was a season of time when it was begin to call the, uh, the new issue. There were times when people all were receiving the Holy Ghost. Well, then there were those. There was a guy that came out of Canada, same place where the uh, latter rain came out of, and said, uh, you know, preach Jesus' name in a conference, and then they started baptizing in Jesus' name, and this became the new issue. Isn't it amazing that such an obvious revelation in the Word of God could be hidden from the minds of individuals that were in the book on a consistent basis? There truly is a clouding of the mind. There truly is the opening of our understanding by the spirit of revelation. It's not smarter people or less than smarter people. And this happened. So they said, let's organize so at least when we license these men, we will interview them, and we will know where they stand in the Scripture so that we can work together based on sound doctrine. Now, some of you know these stories and some of these facts. He also shared with me that there was a, a conference that took place back when there were many Pentecostals and it was around the new issue. And in this conference, there was a vote taken. Are we going to continue to use the titles and baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? Or are we going to receive this revelation and baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? Now, I know from this day and an hour and looking back, you're thinking, how in the world could that even be a question? But 200, no, of the 300 ministers, 100 walked out. Those were those that were going to baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ 
as the scripture teaches for the remission of sin and they would become they would become a part of what would become the united pentecostal church the 200 would become what was to become the assemblies of god you know because when i came to the lord i went to grandma's church and it was an assemblies of god when I was a young boy, we went to a Nazarene church. My grandmother, my aunts, they sung in the choir, my mother. I was very young, first grade. But we left, went to New Jersey, and then when we come back, Grandma's going to an assembly of God. What happened? While her son was battling cancer and then passed away, young, 32 years old, brain cancer, she, by her bedside, in prayer, received the baptism of the Holy Ghost living out in Hare, Washington. So in this, now, they didn't believe that in the Nazarene church, so that became a problem. And she began to seek out, again, those who believed in receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost, speaking with other tongues, and having this spiritual experience. So here she was. She knew what it was in the Nazarene church because her in-laws, great-grandpa Reisman, he was a Nazarene. And that was their beginnings. That was their origins. So I'm speaking towards that faith. So grandma becomes separated from the rest of the family because she's now going to the Assemblies of God. When we went to New Jersey, my mother sought out a Nazarene church in Dover, New Jersey. We went... And we became a part, and my mother would hide in the background. Number one, she was a divorcee, and that was really frowned on. And she had the Holy Ghost. She said she'd never pray out loud in that church. She knew. They did not believe that. But she had received the Holy Ghost as a teenager. One time, Grandma came out for a visit. We, uh, Mom was having another baby. Whenever babies would come, Grandma would come, and she'd come and stay. And I remember the night. She said to my mother and I, would you mind if we went to a different church tonight? I don't know how she even found it. But we went to a church, a different church, and when we walked in and sat out, there was so much conviction. Everybody was crying. There were people, I remember, off off to the side, lifted their hands, and they were looking at the wall, and I'm thinking, they're all looking at the wall. What do they see? Now, I didn't know their eyes were closed, and they were focusing on the Lord, and they were praying, but they were all crying. I looked at my grandmother. She was crying. I looked at my mother. She was crying. I made me want to cry. It was because of the conviction was so heavy. Never felt that in that Nazarene church. What is this? So God is introducing something to me in my childhood, not knowing that I would come back to it at 22 years of age. But it was a progression towards him to a deep place In him. And then thank God. Do you believe that the Lord has been leading your life? I think he started ordering our steps a long time ago. I told you about when I visited the Pentecostal church in Trenton, New Jersey, and there were three people that I drank at the Central House with every weekend. When they heard my name, their heads turned around. They couldn't believe it was me. I couldn't believe it was them. And here we were, and I'm thinking to myself, I live 15 minutes from here. I was drowning in alcoholism. So were they. Why didn't you lead me to this truth there? 
you let me drive 3,000 miles away. My sister ran away. That became my excuse. Go home. Go back to Washington. And it was there within a year I would meet Pastor Daniel Leslie because I worked with his son-in-law. And in a matter of time, be baptized in Jesus' name, be filled with the Holy Ghost. And then he would mentor me in the word of God. We would talk about truth. And we would talk about all these things that I'm telling you. He's pouring out these historical accounts of things that happened in the Northwest. I believe as a warning to me. And what happened in his situation that caused him to move to St. Louis. Does this mean anything to you? Buy the truth and sell it not. Many deceivers have come. Many seducers have come. Deceiving and being deceived. How do I know? I study the original. I spend time in the original. Wait, wait, don't say that that way. That's not even close. It's, you know, this is what the word says. Oh, well, yeah. See. If I am to believe the gospel, not a gospel. First Corinthians 15 chapter, Paul said, I have delivered unto you the gospel, the death, burial, resurrection of Christ. He that believeth the gospel, I know this is basic, basic. I hope it's not boring. Have you passed it on to your children? Did they walk in truth? Or are they in a vulnerable situation? What about your grandkids? They're coming next. Non-denominational. I'm back to this word. Unrestricted. Don't restrict me. Loose, no boundaries, and brag about it. Open, we accept everything. Anything and anybody. I walked by a sign the other day, and I'm thinking, why does the church feel the need to use the word affirming on their sign? You know, with a rainbow flag next to it. Why do you feel the need to communicate out to the world that you are affirming? That's like saying, you're gay, stay gay. Matter of fact, we'll help you. We're affirming. I tried to do a search one day to figure out how some of these groups, where they were before, you know, in their stand, and how they got to where they are, I can't figure it out. But it's, it's miles away. I'll tell you where it begins, not knowing the truth, the truth, the doctrine, the apostles' doctrine, the doctrine of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, I'm adamant about this. I have no room. No room. You know how narrow I am? Straight is the gate, narrow is the way, and few there be that find it. It is an absolute. Broad is the way. Why? That leads to destruction. Many, the most. 
I'm, I sorrow for that. I pray for that. I intercede and, uh, and appeal on, to God for revelation and understanding, knowing that they that believe not are damned. The word, the word. I'm not open. I'm sorry. I'm narrow minded. Yes. All the way. I'm narrow. I stay narrow. I may not always wear a tie, but I'm narrow. Okay? So, this idea of unrestricted, loose, open, no absolutes. The lines are blurred. There are no lines. Here are a few lines and barriers and absolutes. Repent or perish. Buy the truth and sell it not. He made them male and female. You must be born of the water and of the spirit. No wiggle room. Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. I'm reading the Bible to you. John 7 and 37. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given. but that Jesus was not yet glorified. I went to the Assemblies of God website. I wanted to see what they were teaching as doctrine presently. And they, I, I believe it was they that confirmed that when you believe... You receive the Holy Ghost. It's an automatic. Yet we know Paul asked those disciples, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? And if you've had in your own experience where you walk in faith of some kind and then you received the Holy Ghost, you knew good and well you didn't have the Holy Ghost. You knew it. It's a no-brainer. Yet I need the Holy Ghost. For at his return, it is the Spirit, the indwelling Spirit of God, that's going to catch me with the church, the bride, away. So how much room do you want to give? Well, you know, they're only accountable for what they know. Sure. So am I. There's only one way to get the blood applied. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. Sin will not enter into heaven. God give us, God give us a love for the truth. You see, the Bible says of those that did not develop a love for the truth, God would send strong delusion. They wouldn't be confused. It would be God that would send the confusion that they would believe a lie. How important is it for me to know the truth 
to love the truth, to share the truth. I don't have time to talk to you about the pearl of great price. The kingdom, well, maybe I do. Matthew 13, 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto treasure, hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he has, and buyeth that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Buy the truth and sell it not. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Oh, I did a search. I said, what's the doctrine of the United Pentecostal Church? The UPCI believes that one must repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus, as opposed to in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, and receive the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues to be saved, as outlined in Acts 2.38. They're not blind. It's clear. It's the truth. I had found myself in a situation. My wife found some furniture. And I just happened to have a U-Haul truck. So we made a journey. And after collecting those things, blessed transaction and a really good deal. We said, hey, this porch furniture out here, this outdoor, that's nice. Do they want to sell that? Somebody else is selling somebody else's stuff. No, I don't think they wanted to sell it, but I'll, get, I'll check with them. And while we're there, you know, oh, they haven't got back, they haven't got back, they haven't got back. We get back to North Tacoma, and I get a text. Oh, they said they'd sell it. I kind of had a feeling it was going to play out this way. See, there were some... Things thrown out in the conversation, you know, God. Once they found out we were involved in the ministry, they throw out the God word. You're buying their stuff. Okay? And so I'm thinking, hmm, that's interesting. Where's this going to go? We get back. We get the text. Yes, we'll sell that. They get this. We'll sell the patio stuff. Really nice stuff. Tile table. For 350 bucks. And we'll throw in the grill. $600 value. I've been chopping this grill. So I'm thinking, man, that's like getting the grill for half price and getting all the patio furniture for free. I want to do that. <laughs> yes, we'll be back in the morning. So we go in the morning. And a few things come up in conversation. We happen to know some of the same people. Only the people that they are referring to, they walked away from this a long time ago. Oh, they're doing their thing. It's a really big thing. But they walked away from this a long time ago. And my wife and I and this gal are talking, and I'm thinking, I cannot stand this. I cannot hold my tongue. Without using names. So you should ask him what her, his roots are. Huh? My wife says, oh, yeah, they used to be a part of us. Yeah, ask him. Ask him where the roots are. Larry Schoonover, he knows my name. Ask him. And I'm thinking, if, if she asks, great. If she doesn't, great. Let it cause her to wonder and question and look for themselves. I just can't stand not to say anything anymore. The hour's too late. I don't want to see people walk in blindness, blindness, blindness. 
We have the keys. We do have the truth in the redemptive message. And God continues to lead us and guide us into all truths. Why? Because we receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Then them that are led by the Spirit of God. It's all in there. And I, I know I'm probably boring some of you. Jesus' name. It's magic. Yeah. If you've never been, walk you up here. We'll hold you under the water. And we will recite the magic name. The name of Jesus. It's magic. It'll remit your sin. No, there's no magic in the name. But why is there so much insistence in the word of God that we use the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in the waters of baptism? Because it's an acknowledgement of to wit that God in Christ is reconciling the world unto himself. It is the acknowledgement of God in Christ. Oh, no, 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 no. You don't believe in the Trinity? You see where I'm going? You know that many, most churches in the land call themselves churches. They propagate a message of three co equal, coexisting persons. Therefore, we surely must baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Without ever saying the name. You understand? There's no acknowledgement. There's, there is not understanding. There's no acknowledgement of God in Christ. And this is, this is why Pedro Guzman writes me and says, We had 50 in church the other day. But now I'm getting all, and I've been teaching the oneness. Or I've been teaching Jesus' name, Baptist. And he says, now I'm starting to get these calls in these texts. You don't believe in the Trinity? And so we're just, we're praying, we're waiting on God. I said, that's good. You know, Paul met up with the same stuff. And there were those that rejected him. There were those that tried to kill him. And then there were many that when they heard, later they believed. You're in a good place. wants to deal with persecution because of what you believe. You know, it's just so easy to roll over and say, well, you know, we just accept everybody, anything, and really doesn't matter. Just to accept Christ. Come on. Come on. <laughs> this is too tight for some. It's too straight. It's too true. In our humanity, we want to throw out the carpet and make room for everybody. We want everybody to come and hear, receive, and believe, and walk in the truth. If you're under 20, stand up. Ava, I've been in the conviction. I want to get saved. What do I do? What does it mean to repent? 
Hmm, that's close. I wouldn't do this to embarrass you. Repentance is actually a physical action. It's not a prayer. It's a turn. I turn away from the direction I was going, and I turn towards God. Excellent answers. Gentlemen. person have to be to get baptized he that believeth I got to be old enough to believe amen good answer you can sit down <laughs> hi ladies your breath short right now <laughs> how do I know I mean I've been coming to church all my life parents make me go how do I know when I've been born again if I can't enter the kingdom of God how do I know okay like when I get baptized I speak in tongues Oh, you pray for it? Okay. Say that again. When you have the Seventh Day Adventist and you want to continue to speak in tongues. Okay, so once I speak in tongues, I'm good to go then. Does it matter whether, you know, if God's filled me with the Holy Ghost, does it matter whether I've been baptized or not? It does. How do you know that? Where? Which chapter? You did great. Thank you. Beautiful. <laughs> yeah, everybody above 20 stand. <laughs> Woo. I've asked that question before to young people, and they just said, I don't know. <laughs> this is good. This is good. If I don't know, then I can become deceived because I really like the band. And they dress cool. Yeah. I used to dress cool. We're, we're living in an hour, okay? Matthew 28 at verse 17. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying... All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. So, all power. Is that like 98%? So, if he got all the power in heaven and in earth, was there any power left for anybody else? Just thought I'd ask. So, watch this. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Teach them what? It's followed with baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. But what were they supposed to go to all nations and teach? That all power in heaven and earth was given unto him. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. Great is the mystery of godliness that God was manifest in the flesh. Justified in the world, seen of angels, preached on in the world, received up in the glory. It 
acknowledgement. When I go down in the waters of baptism with the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, it is my acknowledgement. Because he said to others, if you don't believe that I am he, you'll die in your sins. If you don't believe that I am he, you'll never acknowledge who I am and you'll never receive the name of Jesus Christ. And we have a world full of it. Ready? Many. Most. Because wide is the gate. Broad is the path by the truth. Sell it not. Share it. Teach it. Provoke it. Don't be afraid to provoke. You don't have to be all nicey-nicey. I'm just saying. The joy of the Lord comes from the Holy Ghost. Okay? It's not practicing etiquette or being nice and kind. Provoke once in a while. Ask the hard question. Poke the bear. Or let him go on into eternity. See, if I can, if, if my life, if I just let people go, 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 then I don't believe what I'm saying I believe. I know. Bishop, you're preaching to the choir. Well, I loved it every time my pastor told me. I loved it. I loved it every time we got in the car. I knew we were going to get into some conversations. It was going to be good, and he was going to tell me all these stories. He was 30 years on the district board. He had stories. But usually everything he told me had to do with some kind of integrity or loss of integrity. Why don't you stand? John 14 and 5, Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If you had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth you know him. And have seen him. Wait, wait, wait. We saw the father? Yeah. And the only express image in the man Christ Jesus. Philip. You, you know, Philip's just standing there and he just heard this. He just heard what Jesus said. And he says, What, Philip? Lord, show us the Father. Now, he just said you've seen the Father. Show us the Father, and it suffices us. Jesus said unto him, have I been so long time with you, and yet thou hast not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. How sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, the words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me? It's about acknowledgement. I mean, look, they were still asking. Man, are you sure? I mean, you know, I, just tell me one more time. Tell me one more time. You know, why are we hearing this same message over and over? The apostles are still shaking their head and wondering, is, is, is that what he meant? So why are there people today still rejecting 
and insisting because they can't see, they can't hear. We pray God's help. Don't become one of them. You know, there, there's strong words in the scripture about those who we should eat with, who we shouldn't eat with, where we should keep company, where we shouldn't keep company. Well, wait a minute. Jesus ate with sinners, blah, 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 blah. Hey, the warnings were put there. The warnings were put there. You got to know when you are winning them or they are winning you. I've got to study the original. I've got to know the truth. Otherwise, I'll never spot the error. Are we finished? Do we need an altar call? Some of you are looking at me in fear, like you don't want to give an answer. I'm just being polite. I think I want to leave it right here. God bless you. Be dismissed. In Jesus' name.